This video contains some, um, some problems that will serve as kind of a review for your section 3536 quiz. Um, and of course sections 33 3 and 34, the product and quotient and power rules will also uh, show up. So you could really think of this as a 33 to 36 quiz if you wanted to. Um, the problems I'm going to do, um, I'm going to start with number 5. Uh, actually, let me list the problems that I'm going to do, and I would highly recommend before you watch this video that you go ahead and do these problems um, yourself. And instead of doing number five, I'll do number six. And if you want more practice after that, you can try number five, which is the same type, and check your answer in the back of the book. I'm going to do number six. I'm going to do the odd problems that we didn't do. Um, that's 29, 33 and 37. And then I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of the tangent line problems. We only did the evens of those so far. So I'll do, uh, let's see, 43, 45, and um, those, are, those both have trig functions. So then I think I'll also do 49, which doesn't. Okay, so there's seven problems. Um, if you want to work through those now and then uh, or attempt to get, at least get them started until you get uh, to a trouble spot, try to finish them, and then you can come back and uh, look at the solutions. Um, number six, <clears throat> they, um, I hope you're looking at your book, so I'm not going to recopy the table here. Given the following table of values, find the indicated derivatives in part A and part B. In part A, they want to know what is f prime of negative one, uh, given that the capital F function is equal to f of g of x. Well, by the chain rule, we know that that means f prime of x is equal to the derivative of the outside function, leaving the inside alone, times the derivative of what's inside. And now, if we want to evaluate that at negative 1, f prime of negative 1 is equal to small f prime g of negative 1 times g prime of negative 1. And I, I need to look at the table to find these values. So I, I can't do anything with this yet, right? I've got to find this on the inside first. So g of negative 1, according to the table, is, let's see, 2. g of negative 1 is 2. And um, g prime of negative 1 is negative 3. Take a look at that table, just make sure you understood how to uh, get numbers out of that table. And um, then last, I just need to find what's f prime of 2. So about looking back at the table, f prime of 2 is 4. So that's negative 12. A lot like the problems we did in section um, 3, 4, where we had product and quotient rule things, and we had to look uh, numbers up from a table. We didn't know what the functions were, but we had enough information to evaluate the derivatives they were asking for. And now, the g prime function is, sorry, the g function is uh, g of f of x. And a derivative of that would be the derivative of the outside function, leaving that alone on the inside, times the derivative of what's inside. And let's see, so g prime of, what do they want, negative 1 again? So here, work from the inside out, f prime, or sorry, f of negative 1, looking over the table, is actually let me just write out this step too, like I did above. Don't take any shortcuts here. So g prime f of negative one, looking at the table, is two. F prime of negative one is three. And then last g prime of two is negative 5 times 3 is negative 15. 
Right. So that's similar to what we did in um, section 3.4 with the product and quotient rules. And now we're doing the same kind of thing with the chain rule. Um, just be careful. Manage your uh, information at every step. Um, now let's take a look at uh, number 29. We've got here the function y equals x to the fifth times the secant of 1 over x. Now, um, that is the product of two functions. So guiding me through this process at the highest level is going to be the product rule. So y prime is equal to the derivative of the first times the second. plus the first times the derivative of the second. And um, I think we're going to have a little chain rule here because this is the secant of something. It's not just an x in here. This is its own little composite function. So the derivative of the secant function, derivative of secant whatever, is secant tangent. And maybe it's worth pointing out here that this was not an x, right? It's the secant tangent of whatever's in here, right? Just like in the last problem, at that first level, we're taking the derivative of the outside function and leaving this alone. We haven't done anything with that yet. And now, we have to multiply by the derivative of what's inside, which is x to the negative 1. And the derivative of that is negative x to the negative 2. Now, um, also maybe worth mentioning that even though it looks like there's two insides here, it just happens that the secant of 1 over x is secant whatever, tangent whatever, 1 over x in this case. There's still just one inside. This is where we look for the what's inside, not here, right? This is where we're looking to see what's inside. And the fact that it shows up twice here, well, that's just because of what the derivative of the secant function is. So, again, when we're multiplying by the derivative of what's inside, we're looking here, back to the original function, to see what's inside. Um, and that's our answer. You can try to simplify that, but there's really not a whole lot you could do. Uh, number, let's see, 33. We've got uh, y equals cosine cubed of sine of 2x. So y equals cosine. I like that notation with the cubed in there. I guess... Um, no, I'm going to rewrite it right now. So it's cosine of the sine of 2x. And cosine cubed means that whole cosine of whatever is being cubed. That's what that means. So um, I, don't th I think you've got no chance of getting this problem right if you don't understand how to move that 3 out to here. Now, looking at this like our little Matryoshka dolls, it looks like there's... Uh, one, two, three different insides here. So we're going to have several layers of the chain rule. But notice here, this is the last layer of the inside. So planning ahead and just having some idea, how are we going to know when to stop? When we take the derivative of 2x, that's when we're done. At the very last stage, the very last thing we're going to do is take the derivative of that 2x, which will be 2, and then we we'll know that we're done. Okay? So let's see. At the highest level, the very out, outermost function here, I've got the derivative of something cubed. The derivative of something cubed is 3 times whatever the thing is squared. Okay? That's, we've done the whole thing. Now, we need to multiply by the derivative of what's inside that. Well, the derivative of, looking at the outermost layer again, the derivative of cosine of whatever is negative sine of whatever. Okay, so now we're at this, we just did that, we just did the derivative of the cosine function. So now we're at this level. That's the, our inside now. So the derivative of this inside, 
the derivative of sine of whatever is cosine of whatever. So now the inside part is this. And then finally, the derivative of 2x is 2. And we're done. So you can see we did our outermost level, and then we had an inside, an inside, and an inside. Those were our three different inside, inside, inside. Um, <clears throat> that's certainly as nasty as that ever gets in terms of the number of layers. And I'd be surprised if you saw one with that many layers of chain rule on the quiz. Um, but you never know. Um, next one, number 37. Y equals x minus 5 over 2x plus 1 cubed. This doesn't look as bad. So let's see. It looks like we just have one inside. So the derivative of this, the derivative of something cubed is 3 times that something squared times the derivative of what's inside. Well, the derivative of what's inside, we'll need the quotient rule for that. So I'll do low d high, which is just 1, minus high d low, the derivative of that bottom is 2, all over low, low. And um, if it bothers you to leave it that unsimplified, you might notice you got a 2x here minus 2x. That often happens when you're taking um, the when you're using the quotient rule on a rational function, where the uh, the top and bottom powers are the same. This often happens. Uh, so you could, if you wanted to, you could do one little bit of simplifying. I know some of you are compelled to do this. Some of you are not. So just to satisfy that, if you feel like you need to do that, the 2x's cancel out, and then I have 1 plus 10. So it would be 11 over 2x plus 1 squared. All right, the 2x is canceled, and then I distributed the 2 in here, 2 minus sign, so that made it a 10. That's an 11 there. And then you might also notice here that you've got 2 of those here and 2 of those here. And a 3 here. So probably the most simplified version, and maybe the answer in the back of the book, which I haven't checked uh, right now, might be 33, that's the 3 times the 11, and I got two of these, x minus 5 squared over, and then I've got two of those and two more of those all on the bottom, so 2x plus 1 to the fourth. Um, I guess that that's probably what they have in the back, and that's how they got there. Um, okay, let's do a couple of tangent lines. Number 43, we have uh, y equals x cosine 3x, and we're supposed to find the tangent line at x is equal to pi. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and find the derivative of this. The derivative, uh, using the product rule and a little bit of chain rule, is the derivative of the first, 1, times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. Derivative of cosine is negative sine 3x times the derivative of what's inside, which is 3. Okay? Now, to find the equation for a line in point-slope form, I need a point and I need slope. So I need to take my x value, plug it in here to get the point, and then plug the same x value in here to get the slope. So the point is going to be pi, comma, whatever we get when we plug pi into this. So uh, let's see. I guess we could do a little scratch work over here and say, or maybe I'll do it down here. So the point we want to find y is equal to pi times the cosine of 3 pi. 
And if you think about a cosine function, um, we've got at 0, it's equal to uh, 1. And then at pi, it's negative 1. And 2 pi, it's back to 1. 3 pi, it'd be back down to negative 1. So cosine of 3 pi is negative 1. So that's negative pi. So our point is the point pi comma negative pi. And then the slope, I've got to plug pi into this mess. So let's see, y prime is equal to cosine of 3 pi. Well, we just did that, and that's convenient anyway. And then uh, x is pi times minus sine of 3 pi times 3. So the cosine of 3 pi is negative 1. And uh, the sine of 3 pi is 0. The sine function uh, comes back to the x-axis at every multiple of pi, at 0, pi, 2 pi, and so on. So that's 0, so that's all gone. So it looks like our slope is negative 1. So I'm just going to write this in point-slope form. Uh, y minus y is equal to the slope times x minus x. And um, it looks like um, there is some simplifying here, isn't there, that could happen because uh, if we move this to the other side and distribute this, you get y plus pi is equal to minus x plus pi. Those cancel out. So it's actually just the line y equals minus x. But I would, I would accept that. Um, Okay, let's try another one. Uh, number 45, scoot up a little bit there, uh, is the function y is equal to secant cubed pi over 2 minus x. And we want to do the tangent line at x is equal to negative pi over 2. All right, let's see if we can handle that. Go ahead and find the derivative. Y prime is equal to the derivative. Remember, secant cubed, that's um, here. Let's just get that out of there and say, should have done that in the first place. Um, that's what that means. So the derivative of something cubed is 3 times that thing squared times the derivative of what's inside. Derivative of secant of whatever is secant whatever tangent whatever. And then don't forget this. The derivative, this is not just a plain old x. The derivative of what's inside here, that's just a number, so the derivative of that is zero. But the derivative of minus x is negative one. Easy to just um, get everything and forget that. So uh, you can pause for a second and just to make sure you're okay with that. All right, now let's see if we can find our um, point and slope. The point that we need is the point at negative pi over 2, comma, and let's see what we have. Y, I'm plugging it back in here now, the original function. Y equals the secant of pi over 2, minus negative pi over 2 is pi cubed. Now secant is cosine upside down, and the cosine of pi, here, let's write that out. That's 1 over cosine of pi. And thinking about the cosine function, starts at 1, by the time you get to pi, you're at negative 1. 1 over negative 1 is negative 1, and negative 1 cubed is negative 1. So there's our point. Now we need our slope. And to find the slope, we're going to plug the negative pi over 2 into this horrific mess. Let's see if we can't get through that. And you'll, you can check my answer in the back of the book and see if I haven't made a mistake or not. But um, Hopefully we'll be OK. Uh, keep in mind that pi over 2 minus negative pi over 2, every one of these is going to turn into pi, right? Because every time we do pi over 2 minus negative pi over 2, that's going to be pi, pi, pi. 
So that's uh, secant of pi squared times the secant of pi times the tangent of pi times negative 1. We already did the secant of pi. We know that's negative 1, right? That was this. So that's nice. Um, 3 times negative 1 squared times negative 1 times the tangent of pi. Uh, let's see, the tangent function is sine over cosine. The sine of pi is 0 hey, over cosine. So that's 0. And then I guess nothing else really matters, right? Uh, so all of this just turns out to be 0. Looks like we have a, what does that mean? That means we have a horizontal tangent line, because this is, sorry, I should have written slope here. We're finding the slope. Slope is 0. And the equation, you can write out some qua crazy point-slope form, but of course the equation for a horizontal line is just y equals whatever the y-coordinate is. How about that? Oops, sorry, I'm slightly off the page there. There you go. And one more, number 40, what do we decide? 49 we would do. 49, we've got uh, this time no trig involved. Y equals x squared times five minus x cubed to the one half. I rewrote that square root as the one half power because that's what uh, I like. Oops, that's an x squared, sorry, not x cubed. All right, and we want to do this at x equals one. So, same as before, we need to find the point, which is going to be the point 1 comma something, and then we want to find the slope. So, let's go ahead and take our derivative. Uh, this is a product, derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, the derivative of this, the derivative of whatever to the one half is one half times the whatever to the negative one half times the derivative of what's inside, which is negative two x. Because the derivative of five is zero, derivative of minus two x, uh, minus x squared, sorry, is minus two x. All right, so let's find our point. Our point is what we get when we plug one into the original function, right? We're looking for a y value. So y is equal to 1 squared times 5 minus 1 squared to the 1 half. That's just 1. 5 minus 1 squared is 4 to the 1 half. And 1 half power means square root. The square root of 4 is 2. So my point is the point 1, 2. And then the slope, I'll write it down here so I don't go off screen. Uh, let's see slope. We're going to plug the 1 into the derivative. So 2 times 1 uh, times 5 minus 1 to the 1 half plus 1 squared is 1. You can put the square there or not. We all know what 1 squared is. Uh, times 1 half is 5 minus 1 the negative one half times negative two times one. And we'll be very careful as we go through and simplify this. Five minus one is four, and four to the one half is two. So that's two times two. You could skip right four there, of course, if you want to. Um, this is also four. Four to the one positive one half power would be 2, the negative just flips it over. So 4 to the negative 1 half power is the square root of 4 upside down or 1 half. So this turns into uh, 1 half times, that's that 1 half, and then this is also equal to 1 half times negative 2. And that looks like I have that's 4 plus negative 2 over 4 
or negative one half, and that is uh, seven halves. Really, we want to um, we we favor um, I think for some pretty obvious reasons we favor improper fractions rather than like three and a half that kind of mixed number. Um, so try to get in the habit of writing these things as improper fractions. The impropriety of this is that the denominator the numerator is bigger than the denominator, right? Um, all right, so that's our slope, and then uh, we're ready to write our answer in point slope form. Y minus 2 is equal to 7 halves is x minus 1. You want to put that in point slope form? Knock yourself out. Um, good luck if you did well with those problems. Those are fairly difficult ones. I think you'll be in great shape for the quiz tomorrow. Okay?